this is really a video I actually had no intention of doing. Someone sent me a video clip. I checked it out. I thought that the statements that were made were just off, just docked me off. I said, okay, you know what? This can be a teaching moment because I don't want to just say, hey, here, this guy's a false teacher. This person's a heretic just for the sake of saying it. I also want to be sort of a teaching moment, right? Well, as I look more into, you know what? Let me just look at some more about this person because I've been asked to cover Matthew Stevenson in the past. This guy's got a pretty questionable uh, way of doing things, his, his background and so forth, a lot of scandal. There's been some things that's been brought up about this person's um, sexuality and so forth. And to be honest, it jumps off the screen when you see it. Something happened relatively recently where people have started leaving the church some I don't know, some videos or pictures or something come out. I don't know. But I want to talk about this doctrine of his. Obviously, he's one of these people who he is an apostle. And so is his wife. And that's that's unique. You typically don't see a husband, wife, apostleship team. You, you don't see that. Now, you certainly do not see that in the Bible. So that's unique in and of itself. And so uh, that probably deserves some consideration. But are they going to just say just kind of the standard stuff, the standard goofy things that, okay, we've probably covered before? No, you are going to hear. I don't know if it's the dumbest thing you've ever heard or one of the top five dumbest things you've ever heard on YouTube. At least that's the way I feel. What I'm going to play in probably about 20, 30 minutes is one of the dumbest things I've heard on YouTube. It, I, it, Mind-blowing. And we've, we've seen and heard some absolutely ignorant things coming out of some of these people's mouths. And it tends to be on one side of the aisle, right? How come it is? How come it is, guys? By the way, good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning. How are you all doing? Glad to see you all in the chat. But how come it is that every time we hear something just so backwards, so ignorant, so silly, so just just stupid, it seems to come from one side of the aisle. It doesn't come from the more pe the people that are Christians or who claim Christianity, who are more conservative in their uh, their doctrine and more conservative in their style of worship. It comes from the other side, either the, the more progressive side, the new age sort of people, the more liberal people, or the people who tend to be more Pentecostal charismatic. You ever wonder about that? I mean, think about that. As a matter of fact, for all you charismatic out there, all you Pentecostal, all you people out there who who think that you have the side of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is on your side, and this side over here is the dead side. How come you guys have more heresy uh, than than anywhere on the planet? I mean, that just seems to be what your group is known by, heresy. And when I say this, to come back and say that, you're going to hear one of the dumbest things ever. I, now, maybe, I just, maybe it's been said before, you all have heard it, I've never heard it, so I'll, I'll get to that. But I wanted to go over some things. By, by the way, how come apostles are always, apostles, prophets, they're always laying hands on each other? Now, we talked about this before with the with the T.D. Jakes and Sarah Jakes stuff, and they're always laying hands on each other. Could you imagine getting together with your friends, your homeboys, your girlfriends, your sisters, your buddies, uh, getting together with the fellas and just start laying hands on each other. I have never gone to, let's say we're, we're going to watch a basketball game or something, or, or, or we're just, you know, going to, to a restaurant before we leave, let's just lay hands on each other. And then of course, when we lay hands, what do we do? We've got to say nice things. You, when was the last time someone laid hands on someone else and said, the Lord told me to tell you, you are dirty, rotten, no good, something, something. The Lord told me to tell you, your wife don't love you, your kids don't like you. As a matter of fact, your other son, he ain't really you. You don't hear that stuff from them when they lay hands on, on each other. It's always the good, positive stuff. And so you'll see how they love to lay hands on each other, make each other feel good. Because I, I guess, listen, I guess apostles, false apostles, false prophets, false teachers, they need affirmation. But at some point in time, you've got enough affirmation where you don't have to keep affirming yourself or each other. It's like this, this circle you got going on. Now, this is from another apostle laying hands on these two apostles to tell them how great they are, how they're going to have this dominion, this 
this power coming from heaven. They're going to do all these great, wonderful things. The Lord says, son and daughter, get ready for the schools. Watch you take your train to another level. For you to despise ignorance, you desire wisdom. So I give you my wisdom of how to properly release the prophetic. You're going to take the mysticism out of it. Now, for anyone that's wondering who this guy is, this is the Apostle Eckhart. I forget his first name. Or is Eckhart his first name? Or is Eckhart his... I think Eckhart's his last name. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but obviously, he is sent from heaven to tell these people what they're going to do. And of course, when they're told what they're going to do, the power that is going to be put upon them, nothing ever happens. Think about this. How come every is oh is John okay? Thank you, sister Amanda. Uh, John Eckhart. How come every time they say I'm going to the Lord has told me this, nothing ever happens. This is why we we always say okay, wait a second. You guys have this power. Power. we show show us because we're not coming to you asking asking for you to demonstrate power. You're coming to us. You're putting it before us, saying how much power you have, all of these things, and we never we never see it. The only stories of power or anything miraculous happen is only in your confines, your friendly confines in your church, and no one outside ver can verify. And again, every time in Scripture, when we see something like this happening, when the when the when a true move of the Spirit happened in Scriptures, everybody knew about it. All in the locale, even even when the the uh, the Pharisees, the lead, the religious people said. You, Jesus, you cast out demons by Beelzebub. They didn't say that a demon wasn't cast out. They just said that it must be the devil that, that's causing you, that's giving you this power to cast out other devils. They didn't deny it. All we're saying is, when we say to people like that, why are you telling us this and no one knows this but you? It, there's a problem right there. Come to me, come to me. I need you to face the prophet. With me. Here's what God showed me. There is a brand new apostolic anointing that's about to come upon you. Now, first of all, if you're going to lay hands on anyone, it's better to lay hands on your wife. That, that makes sense. Honey, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to lay hands on you. Okay, this is how we're going to do it. Write the script out. Now, make sure, make sure that this that things go according to plan. And notice what he said, a brand new, a brand new apostolic anointing. Okay. I can tell you why you're religious. And it's not just in the realm of revelation. But you are about to experience a visitation from God for this thing. God told me that he was grieved. And if you have a, uh, if you tell people you have an apostolic calling and you haven't done this or haven't studied this, then you're actually in violation of your calling. God's going to visit you concerning the revelation of condemnation. The heart of God is grieved right now because there are thousands of people that want to serve him, but they've been smuggled by the power of condemnation. Now, he's going to he's going to have this theme and we'll find out why this issue is coming up. Um, he said to her that she's going to have this power to kind of reverse condemnation. And he's kind of playing with this thing. He's on this. That's what he's on right now. Uh, not condemnation, but anti-condemnation. Well, who is against uh, this? Who who are the people that you tend to hear talking about we should not be so condemning? Now, we shouldn't be condemning. Cold, we shouldn't judge. We shouldn't call out sin. We shouldn't say right from wrong. Let everybody do what they want to do. Who are, who are we to say what's right or wrong? Well, it's not us. It's the Bible. And who are you to judge? Well, it's not us again. It's still the Bible. And again, the Bible does give us leeway to judge to do so rightly, not hypocritically, but to do so rightly and righteously. But that's something that is kind of in his mind about not judging, not condemning. 
And the Lord says that he gave his New Testament apostles the responsibility to reverse the power of condemnation. And there is an entire species both in and out of the church that are going to come to you because you're going to be the first voice that they hear that they do not feel condemned. Just that's that's pretty comforting. They're going to come to you because you'll be the first voice that they they, they will hear here and they won't be condemned. But what if they're in sin? What if they're in error, either spiritually uh, or doctrinally? They have done something. So just let it pass. Just uh, begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. There it is. Well, listen, you cannot be an apostle worth your weight if you're not going to lay hands on folks and there be no tongues. It, it's like the wet with the water. You got to have one with the other. And so if you're going to be a false apostle, which they are, if you're going to be one, you've got to also have what? False tongues to go along with it, right? Father, we thank you, God, for this vessel. We thank you, God, for his life. We thank you for his legacy. We thank you for his labor of love. Father, we honor him today, and we thank you, God, that you are shining light upon him, and that you are called. By the way, these are some nice things that she's saying that God is doing to him shining his light, sharing his glory with him, honoring him. Causing your glory to be stretched out upon him. Father, we thank you, God, that even the heavens has been cracked open over him today. We thank you, God, that honor has paved a way for his future. We thank you, God, that honor has paved a way even for prosperity. That's pretty cool. Honor has paved a way even for prosperity. Let's make sure, make sure you take care of our pockets, Lord. Let's make sure we've got that down, Pat, as well. Now, the video that was sent to me, the link that was sent to me, I checked it out and it's like, wait a second, this, okay. See, it's one thing if you, if you blur the lines here, but, but you want to blur the lines everywhere. And this video is just, <laughs> you know, you're a bad preacher when it, every five minutes you have a bad doctor, you have heresy. And so immediately I look at this thing and it's like, what? Let me go ahead and play it for you guys. Because many of us got saved out of fear of hell and not love of Jesus. We didn't hear enough about Jesus at first. We heard the wages of sin was death and the gift of God is eternal life. So we're like, oh crap, I don't want to go to hell. Want to go to hell? Hell no. Want to go to hell? Hell no. We seen that stuff in church and we put a fear of hell in people. We make them watch rapture movies and we tell them, you better get ready. You better get ready. All of all, all the while, the son of man is sitting there like, hey, can I be exalted? I said that I would be lifted. I would be the one that draw. Don't use hell to recruit people for me. Use my love. My restoration my redemption i'm the one that needs the attention hell ain't bigger than jesus hell is a reality but it is not the gospel i said hell is a reality but it is not the gospel hell is a reality but it is not the gospel paul said we preach not ourselves we preach not ourselves but christ you preach hell, people manifest hell. You preach Christ, people manifest Christ. I want you to use this to let God deliver you from a judgmental spirit. That's my whole message. You got some in your eye. There is a judgmental spirit in people through religion. I told you that's his thing, uh, not to be judgmental. When people say you shouldn't be judgmental because I don't want you to, to eventually find out what I should be judged about, what I should be condemned about, what I'm doing, a particular sin that I'm in. Again, I won't go too far into what he's being alleged to be involved with uh, relating to his sexuality. You all can you all can guess. And there's been some stuff that's happened recently. OK, um, folks are still not going to. They'll see that. I think people are, are leaving. I don't know. But. He doesn't want you to be condemning. He doesn't want you to be judgmental, especially towards him. But he says that if you preach hell, people will do, will do what? They will manifest hell. These people will manifest hell. Well, no, that's not true. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, let's go to the Bible and let's see what Jesus says about hell. 
since we're, we should not, Mr. Apostle, we should not be preaching hell, telling people about hell. Well, let's see what Jesus says about hell. How about that? He says in Matthew, and as a matter of fact, in honor of Dr. Apostle Matthew Stevenson, I could have taken the scriptures out of other books of the Bible, out of other of the Gospels, Luke or Mark, but why not just go out of Matthew? How about that? This is for you, Matthew. In Matthew 10, 28, he says, and do not fear those who kill the body, uh, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body, I mean, both soul and body in hell. Jesus should not be doing that, right? Jesus should not be speaking of hell. And speaking of hell, here comes this <laughs> this cat. I don't know how he got in this room, but this cat is here. And so I'm pretty sure he's going to jump up here in just a second to try to disrupt me. He's already done so. Jesus also is telling people to, in Matthew, Matthew 11, 20, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Look what he says. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Look what he says. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, you will be exalted to heaven. Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained till this day. So here we've got Jesus speaking about the dangers of hell, the pitfalls of hell. Is, is, are we going to tell Jesus, Jesus, don't be judgmental. Jesus, don't condemn. Jesus, if you speak about hell, people will start manifesting hell. Well, no, no. Remember, uh, Apostle. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Apostle, Mrs. Mrs. Apostle, Apostles. Makes you wonder what their what their mailbox looks like. Does it say Mr. and Mrs. Apostles? Does, does it just say, you know what? Keep the mail. We already know what's in it. The Lord has shown us what's in it. I don't know. But anyway, if he had any sort of biblical understanding and sense, he would know that we don't have to manifest hell. We're already born sinful. We already have... Um, all this sin in us. And so what we manifest is just our nature and all Jesus is doing and all any of us should be doing is warning people of the dangers of that. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is warning people of the potential um, punishment for our sin and our nature and then letting them know that deliverance, uh, there's the word deliverance, salvation is available through Christ Jesus by merely placing your faith in him. That's what the gospel is. And so we're even told, Jesus tells us, even in Revelation, well, John has told us, uh, Revelation 16, 10, let's start there. He says that the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. They weren't going to repent. So should we not tell people to repent of their deeds, of their sins? Should we never say that? We got a problem. We got a problem with you. Now, the reason why he says that is because he's been getting attacked. He's been having people come at him from all sorts of angles, uh, from the from his mannerisms, from his clothing. And we're going to bring up scriptures about his mannerisms and his clothing uh, in just a little bit. But I'll just play the video. Thank you so very much. Grace to you in the name of God, our father. In Jesus' name, who is the very Christ of God. It is I know what you're thinking. I thought the same thing. What in the world is he wearing? What, what are you wearing? A man has no business wearing something that... I'll cover the... You know what? No, I'll cover the passage now. I'll cover the passage now. The Bible, Paul tells us that it is a sin to, for a man to be effeminate. That goes without saying, and the word that's used for effeminate, the Greek word is malakos, which is this, the softness, this, you see the mannerisms. And so this is not something, hey, Corey, we're being, we're being too harsh. Somebody said tablecloth. We're, we're being too No, we're not being harsh. These are things, if, if we say something is soft, then that's something that we see with our eyes and make a judgment. And so to be soft as a man is a sin. And Jesus spoke about even not just being soft, but about soft clothing. 
let's go to a book that you have the same name of, Matthew, Matthew chapter 11. Let's go there. It says, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Look what he says, a man dressed in soft clothing. And this word right here, look to the right, is the Greek word for malakois. This is soft, fancy, the same word for homosexual, effeminate. And so the kind of clothes that he's wearing, it is sinful and people call him out for that. And so the reason why you get these accusations, one is because your clothing, also your mannerisms. You know who, who never has to worry about these allegations? Men. I mean, I mean, males, I mean, men who aren't trying to uh, even brush up against the line of being homosexual or being soft. I've been called a lot of things. I've been called a, ho a whole bunch of things, but no one's ever accused me of being gay. You know, you, you, you might say, hey, Corey, you are you are a false teacher. You are you are from the pit of hell. OK, fine. But you ain't called me gay. <laughs> you didn't call me soft. Those won't come out your mouth. And it should never come out of anyone else's mouth about a pastor. But this man exudes it. Just listen to his voice, listen to the mannerisms, look at the clothing. It is an honor to be here and to serve the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Your tomorrow has been sanctified. And don't you like that that um, that, that that kind of talk? And forevermore. Oh, Stop it, please. <laughs> Stop it. Joshua chapter one, the Bible said, wash yourself against tomorrow because tomorrow he will do wonders in the midst of you. You may be beloved. So before we move forward, by the way, thank you, Sheila. Uh, <laughs> it's just, first of all, where do you find that outfit? I would love to know. I would, hey, you know what? Um, the reason why I would love to know so I can mark it off. I would, I would, I would, I would apply Romans 16 to that. I'm gonna mark and avoid that shop. No man should be in that shop. Listen, get you a t-shirt on, get you a, a long sleeve shirt, a button up shirt. I prefer you wear a tank top, something. Do not wear that. Do not wear, a man should not wear anything that looks like a blouse, like a woman's sweater, which in the next thing we see, but then notice not just a speech, but then also notice and pay attention to the mannerisms. The mannerisms, at least for a man, it jumps off the screen. Of it, we are still in group therapy. <laughs> I don't know where you come from or what they taught you, but we're going to run. Lord have mercy. Here we go. We're going to jump. We're going to scream. We're going to bow. We're going to lift our hands because I'm married. Now, this word, <laughs> yeah. Well, when I get up randomly on a Sunday and say, let everything. If my daddy would have seen me put my hands on my hip and not just this kind of way where you're tired, but I mean, where you turn your arms the other way like that, or if I twist like he, my daddy would have knocked all my top row out. <laughs> no, that's not happening. And the problem is here in America, we have decided that being male, that being masculine is an issue. No, it's not. Let me just say this before I move on. I, I, I didn't intend to, but I'm gonna get on my soapbox for a little bit. The world needs two types of people. We need, a, we need feminine people and we need masculine people. The masculine people should be dominated by people only by people who have an X, Y chromosome makeup. And the feminine people should be only people who have an XX chromosome makeup. That's it. It shouldn't be the XYs going over to the feminine side and the XX going over to the masculine side. You need men. You need men who know how to be men. Listen, when the when the oil pipelines need to be fixed, you need men out there on those. I'm talking about men who get, get down there, get dirty. You need a little bit of muscle. If someone is coming to save you from a burning building, I, ladies, I love you, but I want to make sure it's a man coming to get me. If, if if the Navy team, Navy SEALs are coming in, love you, ladies, but I'd still, and I know a lady can pull a gun just as much as a man. I want men. I want those that are going to, the, the down and dirty type guys to come out. If a fight needs to be had, I want it to be the men. I want the ladies to be ladies. Nothing wrong with that. You got a problem with what I said? 
take it up with the person who created male and female. Oh, by the way, we're going to come to that. When I told you the absolute dumbest thing that I've heard, this is me, is going to be coming. We got about, let's see, we got about five, 10 minutes before we get there. The absolute dumbest thing that I've ever heard relating to male and female and so forth. We'll get there, but we need men and we need women. There's this blurring of the lines that we see and we've got men that get on stage and people that are looking can't tell. And young folk are thinking that it's okay for a man to be soft. No, it's not. If you want to act like, I'm sorry, y'all forgive me, but if you have these little, as we say, these little punkish ways, these little soft ways, be offended, but don't be offended by the truth. Be offended because it hurts, if that's you. Men are men, women are women. I love, what's the song that Archie Bunker and Edith sung in, in the in the Holland family? Uh, girls were girls and men were men. Those were the days. Amen. Amen. But when you go to the pulpit and you look and you see men abdicating their roles and women stepping in the roles of men, Houston, church, we got a problem. And we have that problem in the body. It used to be, it used to be that you would see feminine men in the choir, which was a problem. Black or white church, you would see men and women. And when I say black or white church, I mean predominantly black, predominantly white. You all know what I'm saying. Don't don't get at me because of that. It's just how it is. Um, but no matter what the church is, you would see soft men, gay men on the organ, on the piano singing, and churches wouldn't do anything about it. Well, if they wouldn't do anything about that, well, then I guess they've said, well, you won't do anything about that. You won't have a problem with us coming up and preaching. And we see that happening. And we see homosexual led churches. That is a problem. And so there is a reason why he is preaching this issue about uh, not being judgmental and not condemning, because it's hard to keep some of those soft skeletons in your closet. Thing that had breath. I literally passed out. I fainted, couldn't get none. <laughs> Vac I'm being, can I be honest? Vacation was ruined. The bar was closed. There, there was nothing I could do. So I'm sitting here, passed out. Oh, never mind. Disappointed. <laughs> Isn't that a good choice? The devil. And so these little mannerisms where you're doing this and that, and so that's 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 problematic. And if he can't see that, it makes me wonder when you see the men on stage with him, what are you guys doing? One, either why are you there or why haven't you said, why haven't you put them to the side? Why haven't you, and why are the other people who are around them, uh, Apostle Eckhart, why haven't you said anything? The rest of you other apostles, I know you all put this, this apostle fraternity that you have, or sorority, why haven't you said anything? Why haven't you gone out and said, listen, brother, that is not in keeping with the scriptures? Oh, I know why, because the scriptures are not a priority for you guys. Again, about five minutes, you're going to hear the dumbest thing ever. Oh, wait, wait, wait. The devil hates the gift of femininity. He despises it. He's tried to pervert it. He has put it on men. He's put it in pastors. He's, he's taken it from our daughters and put it on our sons. And femininity is everywhere. But the problem is femininity is beautiful. We know that you believe that femininity is beautiful. We, clearly. Clearly. I wish I could play more of the clip. There's one where he actually literally skips. He literally skips, but it's just too much um, to play. Now, I told you, you're going to hear one of the all time. For me, it's the dumbest thing I've heard. For you, it might not be, it may, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to rank in your top five, your top 10. This is um, the second video clip that I saw of him. And I thought to myself, are you, are you serious? I just said, you know what? Let me just, you know, see what this guy's about. Clicked on the video, had no idea what the video was going to be talking about. And just let me just hear, because as I said, when you turn on a video of a false teacher, a false prophet, someone who didn't know the scriptures, it won't take long before you see this guy is out of his league and is serving some other God and is certainly not reading the Bible. They don't have any sort of biblical ability to, to navigate through the scriptures. As a matter of fact, what you're going to hear is just, how do I put it? Dumb, stupid, moronic, ignorant, all those things. Let me go ahead and start playing it for you. We approach the book of Genesis like it's the beginning of God. And it's not. It's the beginning of what he decided to write. 
by the time we read Genesis 1, obviously a lot of stuff had already happened because when Adam got there, he had a visitor. Did you catch that? Now, this is the dumbest thing yet, but did you catch that? He says when Adam got there, he had a visitor. It's as though Adam, when he when Adam came around, there was something or somebody's already there. So make sure you don't miss this. A serpent. And we have no explanation about where that guy came from until the book of Ezekiel. So we've got to keep reading to find out that God was doing things, building things, saying things. He had whole civilizations before he formed Adam. Okay, you hear that? He said he had whole civilizations before he formed Adam. He was doing things, building things before Adam. We're going to look at the scriptures and just see how backwards and ignorant this is. But... That's not the dumb thing yet, guys. So now I'm going to play this part over I, in case you missed that. I'm going to play that again. If he did, he got to keep reading to find out that God was doing things, building things, saying things. He had whole civilizations before he formed Adam. Now, that's what you call, and Cheshire put it in, it, it's called the gap through where there's a gap between the early verses in, in Genesis where they think that because the uh, the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the earth, that he was hovering over the earth in judgment. Well, that's not the case. And by the way, I'm going to wait. I, I don't have my Hebrew alert here. I should have put it up because we're going to go through the Hebrew. But even just the English clarifies this. And ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to hear something absolutely stupid. If he did it. He wouldn't have had a right to give Adam responsibility. How do you understand what I'm saying? Now, Genesis 2 gives us a principle, and I'm going to give you two scriptures, all right? Genesis 2 gives this principle. I believe it's 217. Now, if you look up in Genesis 1, we see that six or seven things that God told the, uh, uh, the human race. So let me give you the exact scripture so I know you believe that I actually uh, am saved. Two seven is what I want up there. Genesis two seven. Now, keep this verse in mind. Let's reflect. Once upon a time, God went walking through the garden and said this, be fruitful, have dominion over every creeping thing that creepeth over the earth. Do this, do this, reign, subdue all of the things God told Adam to do. Do you know the greatest problem with that? You know the most powerful issue with that? Do you know the most profound challenge with that? Adam did not have a body. I'm going to play it again. I'm going to play it again. This is the dumbest thing that I have heard. I'm going to play it again. <laughs> that creepeth over the earth. Do this, do this, reign, subdue all of the things God told Adam to do. Do you know the greatest problem with that? You know the most powerful issue with that? Do you know the most profound challenge with that? Adam did not have a body. Do the research. God's instructions to Adam came before Genesis 2-7. He said... Rule, have dominion, be fruitful, multiply. He said that to something with no ears. Something without a physical frame. And this guy, is, I don't want to call him stupid, but that's just stupid. That's just dumb. That's just absolutely ignorant. Now, what did he say? He said, do the research. Now, wait a second. Oh, wait a second, Kairos. I, I, I see what Kairos is saying. I see what you're saying. You're saying eisegesis. No, it's not eisegesis. It's not, listen, it's not even eisegesis. Because if you isogee the text, you still wouldn't say something that stupid, that back. <laughs> but we're going to follow what he says. We're going to follow what he says, and we are going to just do the research. So let's go and put it on the screen, and let's just read the scriptures for ourselves. Let's start in Genesis 1. And let's go to, let's you know what, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image 
in the image of God, he created, <clears throat> he created him male and female. He created them. Now, one thing I want you to pay attention to, I want you to pay attention to, he said, so he created man in his own image. Now, I want you to look at the word for man, the words where we get the word Adam. Look at the word for Adam. You don't have to understand Hebrew too much, but I want you to look always at the lower left hand portion of the screen. He created man. Do you all see it's a noun? It's masculine. And what number is it? Is it plural? No, it's singular. So in the beginning, he created what he says in the first part, portion of verse 27 is he created man, a man, man. You could say man and stretch it out to be plural. That can be done. Hebrew, you can do that in Hebrew, but this is singular. Then he also states that in the image of God, he created him again, also created him. Uh, we know this is a uh, uh, singular also as well, masculine singular to create. Now, <clears throat> then he goes on and says male and female, he created them. So he also lets us know that he created females later. Now, what Hebrew does is it's almost kind of akin to what they have this, this thing called a consecutive why, where I want to say something, but I want to add more to it. The word for why in, in I'll, matter of fact, I'll show you, um, I'll show you that and just matter of fact, let me go to it right now. Let me show you uh, this consecutive why, how they use this. You also have a, a, a version of this in Greek, but verse two, I mean, verse one of chapter two. Why is this not moving over here? Oh, it is. I'm sorry. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the all the hosts of them. So now somebody might come and say there were two creation accounts. There's a creation account where he created civilization. Then God gets specific and says that he's going to create one uh, one person, specifically Adam and then Eve. Which would beg the question, if there's civilization, why would God need to create Eve out of Adam's rib? Matthew, pay attention. Why would he need to do so if there are other women already on the planet? But we're going to debunk this notion about there being any other uh, creatures or creation humans before Adam and Eve in just a little bit. Because again, remember, who is telling us the story of Adam and Eve? Well, Moses is writing the story, but God is telling the story. Moses wasn't there. The only person that, that was alive at the time of this writing was God. Obviously, God existed. And so God is telling Moses what happened. And so if this was an error or if he wanted any, any sort of clarification, he could have stated so. And so God is making this statement. Now, what's happening is, and you see this a lot in Hebrew, you see it sometimes in Greek as well, where you make a statement and then you come back and give further clarification. This is what happens. We know that because one, just the English tells us this, but also the Hebrew. Let's go back to verse one. He says, thus the heavens and the earth were uh, finished. This word right here, this letter right here is the Y. And this means and or can be used thus. Thus, they were finished, the heavens and the earth and all uh, the hosts of it. And so all the hosts of it, look what he says now. He says, on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. Now look what he says. So God blessed the seventh day that he made it be, uh, made it holy because on it God rests from all his work that he had done. Now, seven days he created. Now he's speaking, he, he, he's giving clarification of what he's done in these seven days. He didn't make a statement that he created civilization. He made a singular statement that he created one singular male and then he created male and female. Now, he's going to give uh, some more clarification to this. Watch what he says in verse four. He says, thus, piggybacking on verse one, he says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the, that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, if he made us, if he made male and female, and then he turns around and makes Adam and Eve, if these are two different accounts, here's the question, Matthew, or really anyone that would disagree, then do we have two earths created? Two creations created from chapter one, because it's going to go over the exact same thing of chapter one in a little bit more detail. Are you with me? Let's go back to it. So he says, 
Uh, verse five, when no brush, no, no, I'm sorry, no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain and there was no man to work the ground. Well, wait a second. If there was other civilization, then that statement can't be true. So all he's doing is giving an account because remember, these things happen, vegetation happened before man was created. Are you with me? And so then he goes on to say, he gives an account in verse seven, then the Lord God formed the man. And this is the definite man. This is Ha'adam. So when you see the, the, uh, the Ha right here, if you look in the right part of your screen, that's highlighting green, the Ha'adam, which is the man. Then he formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Uh, and the man became a living creature. So now what we know here is that there is the man who is by himself and we're going to see that he needs a help me, a woman. God is going to form a woman. Again, if there were more people on the planet, Matthew, Apostle Matthew, then God would have simply brought one to him. Now, how do we know that there was no one else before Adam and there was no one else before Eve other than Adam? Because Adam says so, and God is the one that's verifying this. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. He says, and Adam, the man, called his wife's name Eve. Why did he call her name Eve? Look why. He says, because she was the mother of all living. Call high. Call high. She was the mother of all things that are alive. Everything that's living, Matthew, all the people came from her, came from her and him. The Bible says that sin entered the world through who? Through Adam. So it could not be that there was another race of people who may have died through some flood for what? Sin entered the world, not through them, but through Adam. Matthew, stop preaching. Stop teaching. If the rumors are true that people are leaving your church because some, some tape came out or some conflict came out about sexuality, I hope they all leave. I hope every last one of them leave. You have no business being over anyone's spiritual life. You are, you are an embarrassment to all pastors. Not apostles, because you're not an apostle. Neither is your wife. He says, now, by the way, that was the dumbest thing I ever heard, that Adam, that God is making these statements, Adam, you're going to do this and this and this, but Adam didn't have any ears. And Adam didn't have any ears because Adam didn't have a body. So he created Adam, but hadn't given Adam a body yet. I don't even recall being this backwards when I first, I went to Sunday school a couple of times, and I knew the story when I was a little boy even though we didn't go to church. And I, did, I never in a million years would have came up with this. You're trying to be so profound that you will say anything stupid, hoping that people will follow. And guess what? People, because did you hear the people cheering? The people are clapping. Wow, you said something. Amen. So while he's saying something that seems profound, it's really stupid. And while he's giving his little, his little soft mannerisms, touching his face and this and that or whatever, bending his wrist and so forth, no, one's, no one is reading the scriptures. That's the problem. Now, I'm going to address something in just a little bit. As a matter of fact, I'm going to address someone in the chat because they make statements and it leads other people, other people are having the same problems. And so we're going to address this in a little bit. But I want you to hear something else that he says that's, listen, brother, read your Bible. Pay attention. When he got done talking, then he went, formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, blew in him and he became a living soul. My question to you is, what was God doing? One of the most, and I am a student. And I will say this though, sometimes it actually is entertaining to hear stupidity. To hear and see stupidity in action, sometimes it's entertaining, but it's also heartbreaking if the stupidity is at the, If the stupidity harms other human beings who they might not know and they're just hearing something, for some reason they showed up and they're listening to you. At the end of every heresy is a person's soul. That's the tragedy of all of this. But now, he's not through saying ignorant things. What he's getting ready to say isn't, isn't as dumb, but it just means he hadn't read his Bible. Student of prophecy and prophets, one of the worst uh, words in my opinion that I've ever read in the Bible was when Samuel told Saul that because of your disobedience, if you would have, W-O-U-L-D, apostrophe B-E, obeyed me, I would have 
established your kingdom. That means that the actions or the lack thereof of Saul made God put another plan in place because he didn't partner with the original instructions. Well, he doesn't read his Bible. And I, I, I get it. I get it. I'll give him a break on this because he's just not biblically literate. Um, God never had intention on blessing Saul. He knew exactly what Saul was going to do. Remember, Saul is a Benjamin. The Saul's of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he already prophesied long before there was a Saul, long before the people desired to have a king like other nations. He's already said that the scepter shall not pass from the hand of Judah, meaning that the king and the kingdom will be established through the line of Judah. Well, God knows that Saul is not uh, uh, of the tribe of Judah. He knows he's of the tribe of Benjamin. And so God chooses David. And so he knows now. If there was ever a choice, a chance, there was never a chance. Uh, Saul was never going to do the right thing, but to appease the people of their foolishness, he allowed them to choose Saul, knowing full well, here comes David. Here comes David. And so, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll grant him uh, that he's not astute enough to have read and understood what God was doing. Now, I want to address something. I want to address something. I'm not, I don't want to get on you, um, sir. But I want to pull something up and I'll tell you where I'm going with this in a second. I had this conversation with a person yesterday. Apparently, the person doesn't agree with me or my tactics, which is fine, which is fine. Listen, I'm not Jesus, so I, I'm prone to make mistakes. I, I have I make mistakes now. I've made I think I've made two this year. Yeah, I made two this year. I may I may, I may mess up again. I may make another mistake again later this year. Who knows? I'm I'm joking. I'm kidding. All right. I've made more than two two mistakes this year, probably four. Anyway, so I'm prone to mess up. I can I'm 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 not I'm not infallible. I'm fallible. I listen. If if I were perfect, if I were perfect, never would have had the things that I've gone through. Had, they would never would occur. And so all I'm trying to do is be open and transparent and walk through the scriptures before you, so you can see how I get to stuff, and then you can judge what I'm saying and doing if it's correct. Because think about this, how many people are actually willing to actually put their study before people and see how they get to where they're trying to go to? I want people to get this for themselves. I'm not telling you what to think. I'm telling you what I think, but how I got there and how you can also navigate for yourself. But this person that I have a conversation with yesterday who impugned my integrity, which is fine. I don't have a problem with you impugning my integrity. This person, Jesus Love, says, why did you block me yesterday if you think I'm hiding? I didn't block you. Uh, Jesus love, if I blocked you, you couldn't be on this live stream. You couldn't make a statement. You couldn't ask, why did I block you? That I, I, Now, I'm not the most tech savvy, but I do know if you get blocked, you can't put a comment in. I do know that. I haven't blocked you. I have no need to block you. As a matter of fact, um, I'm not the person who is afraid of someone um, speaking to me and talking. That's not me. You got me confused with Marcus Rogers. You got me confused with the with the demon casting team, the Ghostbusters, the, dream, the, the Demon Slayers, and these other folks. You got me confused with them. But the problem is this, and this is why I highlighted you, because you are of the, the, the ilk, the people who seem to think that what these people are doing is OK. The problem that I have with you, sir or ma'am, I'm going to assume you're a man. Because I think most women have it in them to not act certain ways. At least I hope so. I'm hopeful. But people like yourself give validity to other people to follow foolishness. People like yourself who will tell others that that guy, Corey Miner and other folks like him, they ain't godly. All they want to do is talk about other people. Now, I wonder if you listen to any of the other uh, videos where we're actually teaching and going through doctrine. Covered this whole controversial issue of lordship salvation today. Uh, we've covered uh, issues of tongues. We've covered uh, baptism. We've covered tithing. We've covered a lot of different things. You don't show up for those. You seem to be the person that, that enjoys uh, when someone does cover one of your heroes because you don't like sound teaching. And when someone brings it up, you have a problem. Listen, here's what we can do. We can teach sound doctrine. We can edify Christ and also warn the flock of sheep. I mean, warn the sheep, the flock of sheep of wolves. We can do all that. It wouldn't be a problem because that's part of our routine. That's That's part of our walk. As I'm walking... If I see danger, what is it for me to sit and say, hey, guys, look out? Doesn't take a lot of effort, but what it does take is love 
and also biblical astuteness. You seem to like that. And a lot of people on the same side do the same thing. You don't want to hear someone saying, hey, that is wrong, biblically speaking. And rather than you sitting going through the scriptures, you'd rather say you're a false teacher, you're the devil, you're, you're a critic, you're this and that. Okay, fine. But I notice you keep coming back, which is a good thing. I pray because you would you would not be the first person who was upset with how I'm saying certain things and say, you know what? You got a point. You wouldn't be the first and you wouldn't be the last. You know why I know that? You know why I know that? Let me bowl down your alley and for the rest of the people who also deny the Bible as being our supreme authority. I'm in, I'm, I'm being used by the Holy Spirit. Can I say that? That's that's something that you all have. I'm being used by the Holy Spirit. I see you, Pastor James. I'll, I'll get you in a second. Uh, I'm being used by the, the Holy Spirit is working in me. You know how I know? Because everything that I said came out of the Bible, which is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. I'm not touting me. I'm not puffing me up. I'm not lifting me up. I'm, there's nothing special about me at all. I, get out, dog. Get out. Oh, this dog is in here. I'm sorry. See, I'm having my little, my, my little moment and the dog opens the door because they run the house. But everything that I've said has been completely biblical. I've used the scriptures. I haven't said anything that is not in the Bible. Nothing. So that being the case, isn't that what, how we're supposed to use the Holy Spirit? Sit, Rosie. Isn't that how we're supposed to? I'm trying to get her because she's going to bang into the camera. I know she is. <laughs> yeah. The other day, she she put her paw on the power supply deal and turned everything off. So I need her to be still. <laughs> Anyway, so let me answer this question. He says, I have a question for you. Don't you think it's only logical that uh, we can fall from grace? Scripture tells us that we can fall from grace if we aren't obeying Jesus. Well, that's a good question, my brother. That is a good question. And the answer is no, we cannot fall from grace. The passage that people refer to is Galatians 5, where Paul says that anyone who seeks to be justified by the law or by works, you have cut off, you are cut off and you have fallen from grace. These aren't people that were saved. These are folks who are trying to get saved by the law. We don't see that anywhere else. And so, but that's a good question. But those are the kind of things that we should have dialogue about. Be open to have these conversations. So uh, again, I don't, I don't see where the Bible teaches that we can fall, but that being the case, uh, my point is this, to all you people, and I'll just say this as we're on our way out the door, to all of you people who believe it is okay to turn a blind eye, a deaf ear to a known wolf, I can promise you this, God is going to deal with you as well. Do not think, do not think that you shall uh, escape condemnation or judgment. Remember, let's take a lesson from Esther. Esther is told by her uncle Mordecai. She said, he says, uh, you might be here for such a time as this, but if you don't do it, don't think that God won't take care of his people. Don't think that God won't deliver his people and don't think that you will uh, escape uh, condemnation or punishment. You will not. And so for all of you people who are out here saying that leave them alone, let God deal with them. Who are you to say that God won't use them? The Bible is. And if you won't parrot what the Bible is saying, if you won't repeat what the Bible is saying because of fear, either you don't know what scripture say or you want to be left alone, shame on you. If you don't want to grow up, get up and move to a higher level in the scriptures, shame on you. So what, what was his name again? Let me put it back on the screen because I want folks to know you. Uh, Jesus loves, shame on you. Shame on all the folks who are uh, in love with Marcus Rogers. Shame on all the folks who are in love with the, with, with the demon slayers. Shame on all the folks who are in love with the Daniel Adam and so forth. Shame on all of these people who do not know how to read or want to open their Bibles and read it. Shame on you because you are also enabling other people to fall. Shame on you. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's another, I won't answer. That's a, that's a whole other uh, subject. They do. They do. I don't. And I don't understand. I don't understand um, why a person would not want to. Now, I don't have a problem with someone who who has a different tactic than I do. I just got a problem with someone who is teaching altogether a different doctrine, a different gospel. And because of that, um, here's the warning: not a prophecy, because you guys don't seem to appreciate prophecy that is 
um, negative. You like positive prophecy. The Lord is going to do this for you. The Lord is going to bless you. The Lord is going to open up heaven. The Lord, is create, the Lord has created a new heaven, a brand new heaven just for you. Open it up and it's going to cause these folks to give money to you and pour out a blessing to you so you get your brand new Mercedes. Yeah, yeah that's a lie. No, let me give you a prophecy. <laughs> It's not really prophecy. It's just Bible. God is going to deal with you. You are going to give an account of everything that you say and do. And it'd be one thing if what you said and do, you did out of ignorance. But someone's warning you and telling you, you are going to give an account for that. If you're the cause of people falling, if you're the cause of people uh, uh, going into danger, if you don't want to warn people, then shame on you. So, guys, I want to thank you so much. Again, I'm saying, I'm saying, beware of people like this. But you know what? Do what what is available to you. Use your Bible. It's the one thing that God gave all of us the exact same measure of. I've got the same Bible that you have. I've got the same books in there. Now, if you got extra books, <laughs> different story, but I got the exact same thing that you have. Use it. Read it. Some of you guys have better eyes than I got. My eyes are, you know, a little, they're, they're up in age. They're up in age. By the way, do you know these ARP people sent me another letter? I don't know what they're trying to do to me. They're trying, they're trying to, I think they're trying to tell me something. That's what I think. I think the government is trying to tell me something. They tell me I'm old. Maybe that's what it is. And this dog, uh, this dog is sitting here banging up. A, come here, Rosie. Come here. Come here, sweetie. Sit down. My daughter's dog is here. And so now she is. I don't know if you saw the camera move. That's because she's banging up against. She wants to lead out the door. Sit down, sweetie. Sit. Sit. I guess I just have to keep rubbing her to keep her still. Come here. <laughs> this dog is... But anyway, let me go ahead and leave for Rosie banging to the camera and, and knock something else out. You guys, be blessed. I will see you tomorrow.